Well, all right, so everyone's back. Um, welcome. I think uh, people made significant progress on these questions, even if they didn't necessarily get to the end. And so we'll we'll work through the answers and feel free to interrupt me with questions. If people had some some good comments um, in the breakout room, so feel free to repeat those and you know for the purposes of the discussion. I'll share my tablet screen. Okay, so part A, well, the, the purpose here is, was first just to show you that this relative entropy function, which we encountered yesterday, and this much you probably have, the relative entropy of rho and sigma is the trace of rho log rho minus the trace of rho log sigma. And that looks like a mysterious function, but we saw that it was some measure of the distinguishability of the quantum states rho and sigma. Um, and part A is about showing you that it's a measure of distinguishability that you're probably pretty familiar with. In the case that sigma is a thermal state, this uh, e to the minus beta h over partition function, um, then you get a difference of relative entropies between the, uh, or of, of free energies, I should say, between the free energy of rho and the free energy of this thermal state. So how do you work that out? Well, you just uh, write down the relative entropy, trace of rho log rho minus the trace of rho log sigma. And sigma is this thermal state now. And what I'm going to do with sigma is I'm going to realize that I'm taking the log of the ratio of two things. So it's going to be the difference of the logs. So I'll just break those up and get two terms. So I'll have log of e to the minus beta h uh, minus minus, because it's 1 over z, so then plus the trace of rho log z. And then we just have to read off what these terms are. Uh, trace of rho log rho is minus the entropy of rho. Um, the trace of rho, well, okay, so we have the log of e to the minus beta h. The log of an exponential is just whatever we're exponentiating, so it's minus beta h. And so the second term is actually the expectation value in the state rho of beta times the Hamiltonian. So I'll write this as plus beta expectation value of h for rho. Um, and then uh, log of z is just a number. So that I pick up the trace of rho, which is 1 for the last term, and I just get plus log z. And then, now we're pretty much done, except for the fact that you have to remember a fact from StatNEC. Um, and if you didn't remember this fact, you could probably, you know, you, you could guess the fact by virtue of what I was asking you to, to show. But the free energy of the thermal state is minus temperature times the log of the partition function. So that's something that you probably encountered in a course on StatMech at some point in your lives. Um, but uh, this piece here is, you know, this piece on the right is the free energy of the thermal state. And so we're done. And so we have the free energy, you know, we have the difference of free energies. And so those difference of free energies um, it is a measure of distinguishability, right? It tells you how far, you know, you kind of know that from thermodynamics or, or stat mech. It tells you how, in some sense, how far away you are from the thermal state and tells you how far you are in a very meaningful way physically. It's how much work you can extract from rho um, if you're in contact with a, um, a heat bath at, at temperature beta. Um, and so that, this is a measure of distinguishability that has physical, uh, physical relevance and interest. So part B doesn't have much to do with part A um, or the rest of the, the worksheet. But I, as I say, I thought it was a good opportunity for you to derive something that is good. I assume is going to play a role uh, later in the course, like this, uh, what they call the first law of entanglement entropy. I think it was first coined by one of the instructors or, or organizers of the course, Tom Faulkner, or Rob Myers, and, and collaborators in a paper in which they were um, showing how you could derive the linearized Einstein equations um, using the, uh, the Ryutaki-Nagi formula in, um, in holography. And so we'll, uh, maybe we'll discuss that a little bit more in a bit. Um, but I ask, you know, the, first, the, the first part of the question is, if you take a density operator rho um, and perturb it by delta rho to get it, I don't say, say so, but I should say to, to get another density operator, then how does the entropy change? Right. 
And so we can use the product rule here. So I'll say we have delta rho times minus log rho, um, perturbing the, um, the first row. And then rho uh, times the, well, the perturbation of log rho. So we have to differentiate log rho. And here I have a little asterisk, see the last page. Um, if, rho, if, if rho were just a, a scalar, uh, were, you know, say a real valued function or something, then what you would write down here is one over rho times delta rho. And it turns out that is correct in this circumstance. And the reason it's correct, and this, I have a whole discussion about this, and we're not going to go into it right now, but you can read it. Um, the reason it's correct is because this is all happening inside the trace, um, which effectively makes um, rho and delta rho commute. And Marcus asked a question, um, what paper does this come from? And hold on one second, I can just uh, dig that up. Um, Okay, so the, the paper, Tom will, uh, will correct me if this is not the first paper that mentions it, but it's uh, Faulkner et al. Um, gravitation from entanglement, holographic CFTs. Okay, so we have this, and now we just have to remember minus log rho that's what we're calling this modular Hamiltonian. And um, the second term, the row and the row inverse cancel, so it's the trace of delta rho. Now, we're perturbing rho to another density operator, and we're going to use that fact to simplify this expression for uh, the change in the entropy. So the trace of rho is 1. So if we uh, you know, differentiate both sides, we get that 0 is equal to the trace of delta rho. Um, which means that when we calculate, we can drop this piece. Um, and this is the, the fact that, uh, that I wanted you to prove. Um, there were some comments that this notation here is a little bit ambiguous, but what I mean by that notation is precisely this equation. Right there. Um, now, Maybe just a comment on that paper of, uh, of Tom's and friends. Um, OK, so thank you, Tom, for, for the comment. Um, if you're trying to, trying to imagine how could, um, how could this be related to Einstein's equation, if you remember, the Ryutaki-Nagi formula expresses entropy in terms of geometry. And so this first law is now saying something like change in geometry is equal to change in energy, which is starting to sound something like Einstein's equations. Um, you know, that's just a, a taste. Um, OK, so why is this called the first law? Well, I suggest, OK, let's just try it out in the case of a, a thermal state. So the state rho is now going to be the, the sigma beta, which was the, uh, the thermal state. And I just want to evaluate the um, modular Hamiltonian first. And the modular Hamiltonian here, um, it, just taking the logarithm, becomes beta h plus the log of the partition function. And then we just have to evaluate this change in entropy, which is the, um, the change in the expectation value of the modular Hamiltonian when the modular Hamiltonian is held fixed, but the state that we're evaluating with respect to changes. So this is just, uh, oops. Uh, so the temperature stays fixed, plus log z. And remember, because the state um, associated with h sigma is fixed, the partition function is fixed, h is fixed. And so what we have is the change in entropy is equal to beta times the change in the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. And just um, express, you know, replacing beta by 1 over t, um, we get the first law of thermodynamics. And so the reason this is called the first law of entanglement entropy is because it's a generalization of the first law of thermodynamics. Um, it is the first law of thermodynamics in the case where you um, use a thermal state. Okay, did anyone want to ask any questions about that? Could I ask a question? 
Sure, yeah. I'm just wondering in what sense is the modular Hamiltonian a Hamiltonian? Like what time evolution does it give you? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And it really depends on the state, right? Because you can define this thing for any state you like. Um, and so in some particular circumstances, um, you, you know, it becomes something like a boost generator. Um, and I think in some other, uh, let's see. Um, so if you have a state which is thermal, um, let me see. If you've heard of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, um, right? So if you are in one of these eigenstates, uh, the ther eigenstate thermal uh, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, then if you look at the reduced density operator for some appropriately small subsystem, then you would expect that density operator to be approximately thermal. And so then the modular Hamiltonian of that reduced density operator um, would be a thermal state. And so roughly speaking, if you have a cell, you know, if you take, uh, like it, this is a, a situation that I would expect it to be thermal, um, take some sufficiently chaotic system, you know, there's, there's, there's some system that will, that will self-thermalize, um, start it in some, whatever state you like, let it run until it's self-thermalized, which means that the local expectation values have relaxed, and then look at that, uh, that local reduced density operator, it should approximate a thermal state. In which case, this modular Hamiltonian, you know, up to these factors of beta and so on, uh, it, it's going to be a thermal, uh, a thermal. Uh, it's going to be the, you know, the Hamiltonian of the system. Um, but in general, it can be something very different. I don't know if Tom wants to jump in and say something about it. Uh, oh. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I no, I, not really. I think Patrick said it well. I, it, yeah, in general, it's not expected to be anything interesting, uh, but in some situations, it is. In relativistic theories, it can be very interesting in conformal field theories. And, and I, I think it's going to come up again, you know, later in the course. It's hard, it's hard, it's hard to imagine it wouldn't. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? So just related to that one, in what sense is it is it modular? Oh, uh, in what sense is it modular? Um, I just have to. Or what does modular mean, really? Um, let me. Uh, I haven't thought about this in a long time. I have to um, refresh my memory. Um, and again, actually, Tom is probably the person to talk to. Um, about I, I don't modular. really. I honestly don't know the answer to that. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I think it's his, some historical reason. It's called. Uh, it comes from this theory called modular theory. So uh, I think there might be a connection, but I don't really know what it is. So, I mean, you're thinking about uh, maybe modular transformations, something like that. Is that the, yeah, it's not, yeah, not obviously connected. All right, so let's, uh, let's go back to the lecture. Um, we did not finish lecture, uh, the material of lecture two last day. And rather than refactoring everything into lecture three, I'm just going to continue with lecture two. And when we get to the end of lecture two, we'll start lecture three today. Um, so let's see, where are we? Lecture two. Okay, so we defined the relative entropy. You just completed the second worksheet. And the last thing I wanted to tell you about relative entropy um, is just a relationship between relative entropy and other me another me measure of distinguishability, right? Because um, with fidelity and trace distance, we could relate them to each other. So we can also relate the relative entropy of the trace distance by something called the quantum Pinsker inequality. So remember, the relative entropy can get arbitrarily large, and so we wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't expect to be able to bound the um, the relative entropy from above by um, by the trace distance, but we can bound it from below. Uh, and if you like, I might even you know, share a problem, not, you know, for, not for class, but just for you to work through on your own um, about how you'd prove this. Um, it would involve some Taylor expansions and monotonicity properties, the relative entropy. It's a good exercise. Um, and so states are close in the relative entropy sense. Um, that means they're also close in the operational sense of uh, distinguishing the states rho and sigma, which is what is measured by the trace distance. Okay. 
Now, I said at the beginning that the relative entropy is like the ER, uh, the ER information function from which you can uh, derive all the other ones that you're interested in. Um, we saw that it was related to free energy. If you plug in, you know, if you play with it correctly, pretty obviously you can get out the entropy, which is sitting inside. Um, now I'm going to tell you about another function called the mutual information. And mutual information is a measure of correlation between subsystems. Uh, and the way, you know, how would you come up with a measure of the correlation between subsystems and uh, using relative entropy? Well, what you could do is you could say, well, I want to tell my original density operator apart from the product of its, mar uh, of its reduced density operators, right? Because you can take these reduced density operators, you, know, you, you restrict row AB to A, you restrict it to B, and then you, you make the product. And so on the right-hand side, we have, this, you know, we have the state that locally looks the same, but it has no correlations. And on the left, we have the actual state. And a decent measure of how correlated the system is going to be is just you know, the relative entry between these two states. And if you plug in, and this is a good exercise, um, you know, plug into the re relative entropy formula and calculate, you'll find that this uh, relative entropy is the entropy of the A subsystem for rho plus the entropy of the B subsystem for rho minus the joint entropy, like that. And so I'll just you know, say this is an exercise. Um, and it, it does measure correlations, right? By construction, we already know um, because this is relative entropy and the relative entropy is zero if and only if the states are the same, that the mutual information will be zero if and only if those two states are the same. That is, if the state factorizes. So this is a measure of correlation. And um, a question that somebody asked me, I think yesterday in Gather is, you know, you know, this is somebody who I think worked on, uh, um, well, <laughs> uh, just asked the question, why, why, why should we care so much about these, these entropy functions holographically or elsewhere? Um, and one reason is that it's a, you know, it is a great way to detect correlations, right? So if you want to figure out whether a state factorizes, right? You might have imagined that what you had to do was you, you maybe you had to take like a spanning set of observables uh, for A and a spanning set of observables for B, and then you evaluate the correlator for, you know, for every one of those observables, and you check that there's never any correlation to the system. And if there was never any correlation, you could say, okay, well, then they factorize. But this is much easier, right? All you do is evaluate three entropies, take some linear combination, and if there's zero, then it factorizes. So by evaluating these entropies, you can really detect correlations without having to actually explicitly know in what form they manifest themselves, which observables are actually correlated with each other, if any at all. Um, now, relative entropy has a monotonicity property. And the way that that manifests itself in mutual information is, again, something that you would expect and hope for a measure of correlations, that you can't increase correlations by acting locally. right? And so how does that, uh, what does that look like? The mutual information between A and B for rho is at least as big as the mutual information between A prime and B prime if I act locally on A and B to produce A prime and B prime. And this again, you know, this just follows directly from the monotonicity of relative entropy. And you, know, you, you, can, you can double check that if you want to. Uh, and so if you could increase correlations by acting locally, this would not be a measure of correlation that was detecting all the correlation was present. Um, but because you can't increase correlations by acting locally, this is kind of morally telling you that every, you know, all the correlations that are present uh, are being found by this function, or at least you know, it seems that way. Now, there's one particular special case of this monotonicity that, is, um, that plays a really important role. Uh, well, <laughs> it, it plays the the central role in, uh, in quantum information theory, if, there's, if there were one inequality that were more important than all the others, it's called strong summativity. And it's just this. The mutual information between A and a pair of subsystems B and C um, is at least as big as the mutual information between A and B. Excuse me, can I ask a question about the previous inequality? Sure. Uh, yeah. Just wanted to know if N1 and N2 are two 
noisy channels that act respectively on the two separately on the two subsystems A and B. Is that the idea? That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay, so acting only. Okay. So a, uh, N one maps A to A prime, and N two maps B to B prime. Yeah. And and so a special case of that in in you know here is N one does nothing, and N two in you know in this in this uh, in this second line is the partial trace over C, which is an example of a quantum channel. Um, and if you just write down you know, our formula for the mutual information here uh, and cancel the, the entropies of, of A, which appear on both sides, then you get the following inequality. The entropy of AB plus the entropy of BC, so there's this overlap system B, is at least as big as the entropy of ABC plus the entropy of B. Um, and in some sense, there's only one non-trivial inequality obeyed by the von Neumann entropy. And this is the non-trivial inequality obeyed by the von Neumann entropy. Every other inequality that we know of just follows from this uh, through simple manipulations. And so everything you know, you have everything of, uh, you know, of value in the in the von Neumann entropy is captured by this inequality. Um, that any, anything that any else anyone has ever been able to use it for. Okay, and the last thing I want to tell you about with mutual information immediately is just again how to relate it to an operational question, which is the correlation uh, uh, correlation functions, I should say. So let's think about a situation where we have a product observable. So there's an observable op observable on A tensor product observable on B. Um, with, hmm, I have to remember what, what I wanted to say about with one moment. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> I do, yeah. Um, and I want to bound these observables appropriately. Um, so let's just bound their largest eigenvalues. Larger, modulus of their largest eigenvalues less than or equal to one. So we have this Pinsker inequality, right? I think, I think it will actually fit on the page. It's right there. So it relates relative entropy to trace distance, which means that mutual information can be related to trace distance. So let's just write that down. Our mutual information uh, by the Pinsker inequality is at least one half and I'm going to use this uh, property of the trace distance that it bounds the expectation value observables. And I take the difference of rho and sigma, so that's rho AB in this case, minus the, the product of the marginals. So there's my Pinsker inequality. But if I expand this, this is one half, and I have to take the expectation value of uh, the A observable tends to the B observable in row AB. So that's just the expectation value of this product observable in the state row. But then I take the expectation value of the product observable for the product state. So I get the product of the observables, or the expectation values, I should say. So this is the connected correlator. So, the, so if the mutual information is bounded, that tells you that, um, the correlate, you know, that the correlation functions are bounded for any possible observable that you choose once you properly normalize them. Um, and again, if you haven't, if you haven't played with, that, with this, it, this, is, this is a statement of great power, right? It means that you don't need to a priori know how the correlations are going to manifest themselves. Like if a system is thermal, thermalizing, you, you just might not know the right observables to think about. Um, like how the correlations are kind of disappearing into the system, but the entropies are going to allow you to track uh, how the how the correlations move and tell you about every possible observable at once, um, and the correlations at once. Other questions about that? I have a conceptual question. Sure. Um, so basically, from the lower bound on the mutual information, it seems like we can find out whether system A and B are correlated in some way. Is mm -hmm. that 
different from the intrinsical definition of entanglement between system A and B because I remember you mentioned that it is uh, non polynomially hard to figure out whether states A and B are entangled or not, but it seems like mutual information calculation is just polynomially hard. Yes, so it, it is different. Um, that mutual information doesn't care what kind of correlation is present in the state. So you could have two classical bits you know, um, that, are, that are correlated, and you could evaluate their quantum mutual information, and you get the classical mutual information of those bits. Um, and so that's the system that doesn't have any entanglement as, as we would usually think about it. We're going to have an electron entanglement. We'll, we'll get into that later. But it has classical correlation. Um, and um, yeah, and so mutual information it, it, you know, uh, is, uh, is an equal opportunity measure of correlation. It doesn't care whether you're entanglement or whether you're classical. But it, entanglement is in some sense, you know, mutual information does treat entanglement a little bit differently in the sense that if you evaluate this mutual information for a maximally entangled state of two qubits, like that 0, 0 plus 1, 1, the answer you'll get will be 2. Well, if you, it will be log 2, I should, I should say, right? Um, so it'll be a bit, or sorry, two log two. So it'll be two bits worth of information. But if you took a, a maximally correlated pair of classical bits and evaluate the mutual information, it would be one times log two. So the entanglement, yeah, so mutual information, uh, it, it doesn't distinguish between classical and quantum correlation, but quantum correlations can lead to higher values of the mutual information. And Alec also raised a hand. I, um, can we always saturate the Penske inequality with the right choice of observables? No, oh, no. In fact, we cannot. Um, so, this is a, an interesting fact. Um, the the quantum mutual information can actually be very high. It can be, for example, in some pair of d-dimensional systems, it can be very close to the logarithm of d. So, uh, almost as high as it would be for a pair of maximally correlated bits, um, and you can, and the uh, the right hand side of this inequality can can be arbitrarily small. Um, so I, I actually have have a paper that exploits that effect for cryptography. Um, yeah, if you, <laughs> yeah, I, I could give you the the reference. And so, um, just because the quantum mutual information is high doesn't mean that um, there are useful correlations in the system. We will talk about this a little bit, hopefully, at some point. Um, Really what the mutual information measures is how much noise you have to inject into the system to create a product state. Um, but it doesn't tell you that you can do anything useful with the non-factorization you know, non of the state necessarily. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so I'd like to move on to uh, one of the bedrock, you know, it's, and by now pretty ancient theorems you know, from the 1970s uh, about Quantum, quantum mechanics and information, which is just trying to answer the question, how much information can be stored in a quantum system? And on the face of it, you, 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 you probably say, well, it's pretty obvious. If I have a d-dimensional quantum system, uh, I can sort of store d things. D, you know, I, I choose a, an ortho, orthonormal basis, and I can, um, I can store d distinguishable messages in there and get them back out again. Now, I, I skipped this exercise or this, this example earlier, but I posted the lecture notes. Um, the, in the example that I, that I skipped, we, the example stores three items in a two-dimensional system um, in such a way that you can't actually always identify which one was stored, but you can always rule out one of the three whenever you perform your measurement. And so with quantum mechanics, there are interesting ways to store more than d things in a d-dimensional system. And so it's not obvious that the amount of information, the you know, maximum amount of information that's measured by mutual information is going to be um, you know, achieved when you just you know, store things in orthogonal states. Um, and Hollowell's theorem tells us that nonetheless, that intuition is correct. You, know, that you can't do better. Um, you, you, you can't store arbitrary large amounts of information in a quantum system. The way it works, and it will be an illustration of the properties of these uh, of these quantities. Um, so let's let x script x be a message. They think of it as you know the label of a message, and we're going to encode it as some quantum state. Um, 
And if the message X, and we'll say the message X occurs with some probability P sub X, okay? And the idea is we're gonna, we're gonna store the message in the quantum state rho X, and then we're gonna try to perform a measurement that's going to learn X. And we're gonna, we're gonna analyze that, uh, that situation information theoretically. And it's gonna be useful to introduce a, a great big quantum state, sigma sub capital X Q, and make sure I just line things up properly here. Um, it's going to be the sum over messages of the probability of that message. So this is gonna be a density operator uh, with different terms, um, probability weighted PX. And there's gonna be a classical system that records the message, right? So that I have these different orthogonal states labeled by uh, script X, and that's the classical record of the state. And then on system Q, I have the actual uh, density operator that's representing that state. Okay, so this is, this is just to set up the problem that we're going to analyze. And the first thing we're going to do is just evaluate the mutual information in this state. So the mutual information between X and Q for the state sigma, and I guess this is also an exercise, so you, you can you plug it in. When you plug it in, what you end up is, with is the entropy of the, the mixture over X of the probability weighted density operators minus the sum over X piece of X of the individual entropies. Now, mutual information is always non-negative. So one thing, you know, I didn't tell you this, but one thing this shows is that the entropy is a concave function, right? So if you mix density operators, the entropy goes up. Um, and how much the entropy goes up in this case is actually, that is the mutual information. Um, now, if you read, uh, if you read Preskill's lecture notes, and it, it, you know, they're going to be very, it contains various tricks that will make, make it easier to directly evaluate this. Um, but even with what you know, if you, if you work hard enough, you'll be able to you know, derive this formula. Can um, I ask a question before you? Go sure, on? go ahead. Um, yeah. I just had a question about the notation and that, that state you wrote down, the sigma. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So you, you called this the classical record. Mm -hmm. of the state. Can you help me understand that? Because we're writing this in Brockett notation. And so oh, yeah. So how do, I, how do I think of that as classical when I'm, I'm looking so at yeah. it? The way to think of it, the reason it's classical um, is that, so I didn't tell you this, but these, these script, or maybe I just said it very quickly, these script X states um, are orthonormal. Okay. And so if I, if I just looked at the X system, if I measured in that basis, I would learn exactly which state, uh, which I would learn a specific X. Um, and so this, th this particular density operator, sigma XQ, um, because if you think of it just as a matrix, it's a big block diagonal matrix with blocks labeled by X. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so because it's block diagonal, um, outside the blocks, all those density operator entries are zero. And so that's kind of what I would mean by classical, right? There's no coherences or anything um, between different X's. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, now we're gonna measure that quantum state, or we're gonna measure the Q register. Uh, oops. Now, we've talked about quantum channels and quantum channels are, uh, or measurements are just special cases of quantum channels because quantum channels, you know, they, they encompass everything that you could do. Um, and the part, you know, the way that we can represent that, that measurement is as a quantum channel that I'll, I'll write a script M. And what it does, let's say it measures um, some P of M with outcomes Y. And I'll, you know, in the same spirit as the, you know, as I did in the previous density operator. So thank you for the question. I'll have a, a I'll, I'll call my, my output system of the measurement capital Y. And it has different uh, orthogonal um, basis entries, um, little y, and each little y corresponds to an outcome of the measurement. And the probability of getting a particular y is the trace of the POVM element m sub y against the input state. So this is not in Krauss form, um, but you can verify, for example, that it's completely positive and trace preserving. And so it's a quantum channel. Um, or you could even think about how to implement it. Um, since you know that my comes from a POVM. Okay. 
so we have a monotonicity property, right? So the mutual information between X and Q for the input state sigma is at least as big as the mutual information between X and Y if we did nothing on X and measured, measured Q. All right, so that's the monotonicity property for mutual information. And we have a formula now for the, um, for the mutual information between X and Q. And so what we've managed to prove is that the amount of mutual, the amount of information you can get out of a measurement, right? The infor, so the mutual, the mutual information between X and Y, that is the mutual information between the message, which was X, and the classical information that you managed to extract from the quantum system that was that was carrying the quantum you know, that was carrying these quantum states rho sub x, and so this is the mutual information about the message in the measurement. It's bounded above by the entropy of the average state minus the average of the entropies of the states, and this is the Holovo bound. And in particular. Um, the whole thing has to be less than or equal to the log of the dimension of the space, because the entropy is, and all we're doing is, you know, we're taking some entropy minus some other stuff. And so uh, the whole, that tells us that the amount of information that we can ever extract if we try to store information in, in a quantum system is bounded above by the dimension, logarithm of the dimension of the space. And this is the Holovo bound. And this is, um, this kind of reasoning that I'm, I just uh, demonstrated to you here, this is, this is very typical of the kind of reasoning that is made in quantum information theory when you're trying to track information and bound how it behaves. This is kind of a, you know, it's a classic, uh, classic example. Other questions? Feel free to pause me. So if not, I just wanna, yeah, I just wanna mention another form of entropy uh, that appears, and you know, there's a decent chance that it will appear uh, later in the course. And so I'm not going to. I'm just going to tell you a little bit, a little bit about what it is. It's kind of a, it's a generalization of von Neumann entropy, um, and the way it's some other formula. So I'll write down the formula. So it's param, There's a whole family of these entropies. Param, yeah, and there's a parameter alpha, and the parameter ranges from zero to infinity, real valued, and the formula is one over one minus alpha, times the logarithm of the trace of rho to the alpha. Um, so you exponentiate rho, you take the trace, you take the log, and you put in this prefactor. And the cases 0, 1, and infinity are defined as limits. I guess you could do 0 without the limit, but yeah, it's equal to its limit. So rho to the 0 just gives you um, a state which is proportional to a projector. right? So this becomes the log of the rank of rho. All right, so remember we were saying that the von Neumann entropy was like the effective dimension. Um, S0 is the, you know, tells you the actual dimension. If you didn't have any epsilons, you, know, you weren't allowed to throw anything away and you had to keep the whole state, then S0 tells you exactly um, how, uh, how big, it, how the dimension of the space required to represent rho. S1 is actually the von Neumann entropy. So we've seen that before. Um, you have to use L'Hopital's rule to show that. And S infinity is minus the log of the largest eigenvalue of rho. And one property, very useful property to know about these things is that as alpha increases, S alpha goes down. So it looks something like this. So S alpha is bigger than S beta if alpha is smaller than beta. And why would I call this thing an entropy? Well, you know, it has a property very similar to the von Neumann entropy. It's bounded below by zero. It's bounded above by the log of the dimension of the Hilbert space. And it's equal to zero if and only if the state is pure. So in that sense, it's like an entropy. Um, the main reason it, you know, it comes up is just as a tool. And so, the reason, you know, what kind of a tool is it? Well, it's the, it's a tool for calculating 
the von Neumann entropy. So the way you calculate the von Neumann entropy is you evaluate these Renyi entropies and the limit that alpha goes to one. And why is that easy or relatively easy? Well, because you can, uh, it's generally easier to evaluate rho to the alpha than log rho, right? So that, that's, the, that's the general idea. And so what do you do to calculate the von Neumann entropy of rho? Um, or, or use what's called the, you know, they call this the replica trick, but it's you know, pretty straightforward. You know, trace, you know, say you wanted to evaluate the Renyi 2 entropy, it involves trace of rho squared. You have two, two copies of the density operator and um, you have to square and take the trace. And so what does that amount to? Um, if I insert these green lines, meaning um, you contract on the appropriate index, right? You sum over uh, a common value. Then I've written down tra trace row, or I've written down row squared now. And if I connect the outer lines, then I have the trace of row squared. So this is the trace of row squared. I don't know why they call this a replica trick. It's just sort of the definition, but well, I do I do know, but um, it's a, it's a sort of trivial fact. Um, and a a special case of this um, that is worth thinking about is the case where rho is part of you know a subsystem of a larger system. So let's think about calling it, we'll call it row A. And we'll say that row A is the trace over B of some larger trait, uh, row AB, like that. What does this look like pictorially now? Well, if I label the indices of row A and B, I'm supposed to take the partial trace over B, or so that means that I connect the, the left and right indices and sum over them. And then I'm supposed to take the, the trace of row A squared. So I do the same as I did above. And so that's the trace of row A squared. In field theories, what this amounts to is stitching together, you know, taking your space time, cutting out various pieces um, and stitching, to, stitching them together in various ways. Um, and in some circumstances, you can actually make sense of the limit you know, of taking fractional powers. Um, and that, that allows you to, to get at the, the von Neumann entropy. That's almost as much as I wanted to tell you about Renyi entropy, except for a little bit of an alert, which is that sometimes people will do things like write down a, um, a mutual information type function for relative entropies naively, where they say, well, my, my mutual information in terms of Ren Renyi entropies, I'll just take the formula for mutual information and substitute in Renyi entropies, so something like this. And just a warning that from an information theoretic perspective, this doesn't mean much of anything at all. That that quantity is not a good measure of information. For general quantum states, it can be negative. You know, being product, you know, it doesn't single out the product states in any good way. It doesn't satisfy data processing inequality, et cetera, et cetera. But there are fancier notions of Renyi relative entropy that have desirable properties from which you can extract a mutual information. So I've given you a reference if you want to look up that kind of thing. Patrick? Yeah, go ahead. Back to the purple equation, the subscript on the first entropy on the right should have a row, not B. Oh, right? yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Got it. So as an information theorist, you know, I told you at the beginning, we don't just write down functions uh, because they're convenient. We always like to interpret them. Um, and I was going to tell you about the interpretation of the relative entropy, but um, we're not going to use it, and so you can read it. Um, the relative entropy tells you about how well you can uh, distinguish rho from sigma in, in the asymptotic limit where you have many copies of rho and many copies of sigma. Um, it's an exponent in asymmetric hypothesis te testing. So I'll post the lecture notes and you can read it if you like. Um, so it, you know, it's not just a, you know, it's not just some um, arbitrary function. It, it, you know, it has a, a universal um, operational interpretation. But I think I'll skip it in the interest of getting to things you're more likely to use over the course of the next three weeks. And I think that gets us to the last, you know, to the end of this lecture, um, or you know, <laughs> the end of what I was going to tell you in lecture two. So we should get on to a little bit of lecture three. Uh, you have about 12 minutes left. OK. Um, so I'll just give a little introduction to entanglement. And we're going to spend you know, more time talking about entanglement next day. Uh, and we'll end off, you know, end off the course with error correction. I don't think we'll talk about complexity, but we should have time to do all of that. 
So entanglement, you know, this question has come up a little bit before. You know, um, what does, you know, what is entanglement? And in the case of pure states, entanglement is correlation. Uh, but we'd like to understand the, the nature of that correlation, how, how we can parameterize it and identify it. And so we can ask, what is the non-local beta in some bipartite state phi AB? So let's suppose that the quantum state, we expanded in some basis. We could ask the question, um, do many non-zero alpha ij's imply correlation? Um, you know, maybe, maybe just how many, you know, that if we, if we had a product state, you know, yeah, or you know, we, if we had the state i times j, for example, there's only one non-zero alpha ij, and that's a product state. So does many non-zero alpha ij imply correlation? And you, you may or may not have intuition about this. Some people have intuition that says it should, but it definitely does not. Um, that if I, for example, take the sum over i of i, and I tensor it with itself, then I get the, yeah, the sum over all i's and j's. And so all of these entries, you know, the, the entries can be uniformly distributed and the state is still a product state. So looking at the, at the alpha ij's in a kind of, you know, naively, you know, it's, it's pretty, or in an unprocessed way, it's pretty hard to determine whether a state is entangled or not. Um, but for doing, for doing so, there's a very useful tool, which I've, I've mentioned, you know, without explicitly saying what it was a few times already in the, in the course, the singular value decomposition. So let's just actually take a moment to, you know, to very, uh, you know, to say exactly what the singular value decomposition is. So given any matrix, and when I say any matrix, I really mean any matrix. It doesn't have to be Hermitian, it doesn't have to be unitary, it doesn't have to be square, you know, it's just any matrix. I can always decompose it as a product of something, I'll call it UDV, where U and V are unitary. So U and V are square, they are unitary, and D is diagonal. And in fact, I can even make it non-negative. Okay. Oh, what have I done? Oh, well. So I could write D is equal to D1, D2, all the way down with some zeros. And because X is not square, D may not be square. So I'll just put in some zeros on the side there for, for good measure to, you know, to remind you that D may not be square. And so this is a very powerful thing to know about. You know, if you've done any data analysis or machine learning, you probably encountered a singular value decomposition. But in physics courses, people often haven't seen it because uh, all our matrices tend to be Hermitian or, uh, uh, or unitary. And what we'll do, given this arbitrary quantum state phi, we'll apply the singular value decomposition to the coefficients alpha ij. So they form a matrix, which I'll just call the matrix alpha. And I'll apply the singular value decomposition to that. And that actually has a name. We call that the Schmidt decomposition. Um, and it allows us to write phi as a sum over i, j, and there's going to be a third index now for the matrix multiplication um, of u, i, k, d, k, k, um, v, k, j, i, a, j, b. All right, so I've just applied the singular de value decomposition to the matrix alpha. Um, and what I can do at this point, actually, yeah. Um, what I can do here is I can actually write this as a sum over k. So it's these coefficients dk, and I'll call it e sub k on a and f sub k on b, right? So if I just sum over the i index, um, then I get um, uik acting on i, and so just some uh, some other vector, uh, which I'll call EK, um, likewise for the J index. Um, and because these U and V matrices are unitary, if I, if the I's were an orthonormal basis, then the E's are an orthonormal basis. And if the J's were an orthonormal base basis, then the F's were an orth orthonormal basis. So EJ, EK, inner product is equal to 
fj, fk inner product is delta ij. And so what we've managed to do is we've diagonalized the, um, the coefficients in, in phi, right? And now we can interpret them. So these coefficients are, you know, the, the dk's, which we call Schmidt coefficients, they are invariant under local unitary transformations. And so they are the non-local content of the state. Um, and it also follows that any phi AB and psi AB are related by local unitary transformations if their dk's are the same. And so another way of saying this is that the, the Schmidt coefficients um, parameterize the orbits under local unitary transformations. Um, and so if that is, that is kind of the, the story of um, bipartite, so two system pure state entanglement. It's all encoded into these Schmidt coefficients. And this decomposition is even you know, you know, useful in various ways. And I think we're almost done here. Um, but it allows us to immediately read off the reduced density operator, right? That if I trace over the B system, that's taking the inner product over the Fs, and I get a diagonal matrix on the As. So the, the density operator on A is just the sum over K. It's actually DK squared, because I have to take the, you know, the bras and the kets of EK, EK. And the density operator on B has the, you know, the same DK, same Schmidt coefficients. Oops. And this is a, it's, it's almost a good place to end because this, this calculation has exposed a hidden symmetry um, in the entanglement between A and B. Because the, the Schmidt coefficients are, are shared between A and B, and the reduced the eigenvalues of the non-zero eigenvalues of the uh, of the reduced density operators A and B can be read off from the Schmidt coefficients. Um, it tells us that the the entropy, the entanglement entropy of phi on the A system is the same as the entanglement entropy on the B system, right? Because the it's a function just of the eigenvalues of this reduced density matrix, and the non-zero eigenvalues are going to be the same. Um, and so this is one of the reasons it's called entanglement entropy, right? So it's a function of this data, which is the non-local data in the state. And it's the same whether you look at the A system and the B system. So it's really measuring the correlation, um, provided that the overall state is pure. And I think that is probably a good place um, to stop. But I'll, I'll allow you to uh, Ask me any kinds of questions you like for you know, the next few minutes while they're still recording, and then we'll head over to Gather. Perfect timing. Thanks, Patrick. We have five minutes in the official lecture slot. So, questions? Um, it doesn't so have guess, to be. Oh, oh go ahead, Annie. I was going to ask a couple of questions related to earlier in the lecture. Mm -hmm. um, so, I guess sure. for the Halevo bound, like we're saying that this tells us, um, I guess, how much information can you put in a quantum system? But we're actually assuming that um, the encoding is like classical and the decoding, I guess, it's also classical information. So like, yeah. is it like ever the right bound that we want to use, I guess, in these like field theory applications? Or do you want to use like channel capacities or something, I guess, more sophisticated? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, OK, so the encoding, I'd say that the message is classical. Um, the encoding is quantum because you're encoding the classical message into quantum states, and then you're trying to extract classical data at the end of the day. Um, and I would say that in most in most of the applications of quantum information ideas, you know, in high energy and elsewhere, um, measurements and classical information have not played a, a huge role, right? That it's somehow the more intrinsically quantum mechanical information, the entanglement, um, or just the, the correlation is measured by mutual information type quantities, that seems to be more relevant um, than 
what you know the amount of information that you can extract through measurements. And so, um, yeah, I think it really is going to depend on it, on the particular context. Um, the Halevo bound. Well, let's see. The type of reasoning that appears in the Halevo bound is is yeah. Um, is reasoning that that appears elsewhere because it's really just you know it, it's a it's a statement about monotonicity, and so there you know there, there's some encoding process, there's a decoding process. You, you use you apply the monotonicity statements and you see what it gets you. So that kind of reasoning is general. Um, the Halevo bound itself, I'm trying to remember. Like Rafael Busso wrote a, a paper a few years ago, an interesting paper involving the Halevo bound uh, and covariant entropy bounds, and kind of trying to see how how they related to each other. But I forget exactly what his conclusion was. Um, so it certainly has it has made appearances that Halevo specifically, but um, one of the, yeah, I think one of the lessons also also of my work that I, I mentioned earlier that um, there can be situations where there's a lot of correlation present in a quantum mechanical system as measured by quantum mutual information, but you can extract almost no or negligible amounts of classical information. Um, that's an indication that you should that the you know, that paying attention that or that the, the structure of the state um, is not necessarily well captured by the the correlations that you can extract through measurements. You know, that the, and the, there are physical situations where that can be of concern. Um, and so, bottom line is, I would say, I agree with the spirit of what you're asking, <laughs> uh, but the the answer is kind of complicated and situation dependent. Okay, and I guess my second question was about um, so the, the like negative rainy mutual informations. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess we're okay with like conditional entropies being negative. So is this like a matter of not being able to like assign some sort of like physical interpretation to like these negative quantities or? Oh, well, I guess the fact that it's negative is not really exactly the problem. The point is it's not minimized for product states. All right, like if, if we're minimized at minus 25 for product states, and, and I'd say, oh, well, it, it's still you know, an interesting measure of correlation. But the point is that uh, it doesn't single out product states in any particularly useful way. Um, it may be the case that for some subfamilies of states, it, it does, do, you know, does do a more interesting job, and that might be interesting to study. But in general, um, you just can't use it as a, um, as a diagnostic of correlation. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Can I just ask follow up? Is there a specific type of state for which it is minimized? Do we know? Well, I don't know. The reason I threw that in there is because I canvassed the other lecturers about what they were going to need. And Brian Swingle specifically said, you know, he was interested in the quantum mutual information for Renyi entropies. Um, and I, I said, oh, well, yeah, but it's not really, yeah, it has these pathologies. Uh, and, and so we went back and forth about trying to think about what kinds of states it might be, it might work for. Um, and we didn't come to a firm, a firm conclusion. Uh, like we, we, I couldn't, we, we kind of hypothesized that maybe if the state satisfied some strong kind of analyticity with respect to the Renyi parameter, that you might be able to say something. Um, that the examples where it seemed to go badly were examples where when you moved away from the von Neumann entropy, you know, uh, the Renyi entropies changed very rapidly. So it may be in conformal field theories, it does actually play, uh, it does work reasonably well because in conformal field theories, when you vary the Renyi entropy, it just varies the, the coefficient in front of some, yeah, some function, which is independent, yeah, which say depends on the size of the interval, these for, for intervals and so on. And so, um, so that's a hypothesis, but we didn't prove anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll hear from Brian next week. So. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Um, can I ask a question? Um, so you mentioned earlier uh, about the uh, Ryu Takenagi formula. Mm -hmm. And is there any way to, I mean, get an intuition about geometry from the entropy that you have been talking about in this course? Like for, for uh, a large system, is it possible to see that this uh, entropy formulas can somehow generate or give you geometry? Ooh, that, well, that's a that's a big question. Um, 
so I'd say the reverse is true. Um, that once it was realized that, at least for the uh, for some nice family of states, for these holographic states, that the entropy had this geometrical formula, that would that turned out to, to be it gave us really nice ways of reasoning about entropy, right? And yeah, you know, and and things like this strong subadditivity formula that that came up earlier today, proving yeah you know, the proof of strong subadditivity you know for general states is not easy, right? Like it's it's a it's a pretty difficult thing. The proof of strong subadditivity for holographic states is this beautiful, simple, you know, five-minute geometric construction. Um, and so if you because holographic states are a special family of states, you know, if you if you want to learn about entropy and you only study holographic states, then you might draw conclusions that don't hold in general. But it, it provides this very nice geometrical way of thinking about entropy, at least in some for some large and interesting class. And so from that direction, that, that intuition works, you know, or, or sort of getting intuition that way. Um, understanding how geometry can come from entropy. Um, let's see. So th there's a whole story there. Um, and I think you'll learn about it. There's going to be some discussion of tensor networks uh, later in the, in the program. And, and there are there are families of let's say that there are families of states that have some in, you know some internal entanglement structure which is not apparent um, you know uh, yeah, that may not be apparent when you start but um, but then you you see that you can actually um, construct the state as the contraction of some tensor network with some interesting structure and the tensor and it works out that the tensor network um, that can be used to represent you know, to represent a state um, looks like a yeah, if it's a holographic state it looks like a tensor network where the tensors kind of live at different points in the spatial geometry and so the entanglement structure of the state does seem to be you know, very closely related to the geometry and if you learn you know, if you can find some parsimonious way of representing some given quantum state using one of these tensor networks that's some kind of hint of some hidden underlying geometry and the entropies you know, a lot. You know, it's really the entropy that tells you the structure of this entanglement. So there's a whole story there, but that um, that I think is one way of trying to get you know access uh, the relationship between entropy and geometry. And but um, it gets you know it gets much more sophisticated. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And Thanks I might question. that we'll hear a lot more about that later on in the school. So. Okay, other short questions before we stop the recording? Okay, so we can stop the recording and then you can still either ask